I had to change my uh, lecture on the train last night because Matthias, I love him so much, sent me a barrage of emails saying, Stephen, you can't present 100 slides in 15 minutes. I said, if I click it really fast, I can. Anyway, <laughs> I love Matthias. I love Transolar. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm indebted to him for some very amazing things that, that we've done together. And, um, but I have to say that my, my question, you know, is this word, maximize impact. I'm not sure that's really a, 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 a goal. So um, I changed my talk to, to try to engage that. And I'm trying to use Walter Benjamin. So I turned to a German philosopher uh, to try to, let's say, question that sentence. Um, you know, I mean, the question is, is the truth of the world some form of positive philosophy or, or is it the poetry of this world? And I have one sentence from Benjamin. Even if truth should appear in our world, it could not lead to wisdom because it would no longer have the characteristic which it would acquire only through universal recognition of its validity. I want to start with a coronal mass ejection. This happened on the 22nd of January this year, and of course, uh, uh, it's, it's moving at 400 million miles an hour. It reaches the Earth, and it becomes the Aurora Borealis, you know, uh, which in medieval times was a complete mystery to everyone. Now we know, in fact, that the North Pole and the South Pole are connected by three quarters of a second. So this magnetic field is actually moving to the South Pole and three quarters of a second back to the North Pole. So this is an amazing kind of knowledge that we have. And I think more and more today with technology to be able to understand and learn, but that puts us even in a vulnerable position because you know that if we have a coronal mass ejection that's strong enough, it'll put all of these right out of business very, very fast. And actually, this thing told me to, to talk about it that way because for the first time in three years of depending on my phone went out, so I'm kind of without it, and now I can't communicate to Beijing or New York. I've been running my office off an iPhone for three years, and now I can't communicate. So that's, I think that's a kind of, let's say, a vulnerability that we face. And then there's this issue, you know, kind of the issue of what we are in, in relation to this planet and to, to the solar system we ha inhabit. This happened this year again on the 6th of May. It's the largest uh, moment that the moon gets to the Earth, the apogee they call it. And uh, it happened on the 6th of May, but then you see this incredibly scaleless object behind architecture. Um, and moving from the biggest scale thing that we're doing at the moment, I'll just go quickly through some, some that you can see this is a piece of another lecture. It was called Scale. I just gave it at the Royal Academy. It's a section of it. This is a project for Echo City, an ecological city. This is a kind of the, the scale that the Chinese are building. This is a, a new city for 500,000 people. It's currently under construction. And you can see it. it a third of it is already built. Nobody lives there yet. Typical Chinese. And the competition that we had was for the, the center of the city, the seven cultural buildings that were to be built all at once. A new library, a new museum, an ecology museum, a planning. And our concept was a polychromatic necklace of buildings and a kind of orthogonal uh, CBD. This is 11 million square feet. Um, all on a kind of geothermal system that would connect everything. And the idea was to take these different uh, elements. The library would be coming from yellow crystal, the senior center from pyrite, the cultural center from lapis lazuli, the ecology center from malachite, the science museum from obsidian. Each one would be inspired by a gemstone and therefore the geometry and the way the, the architecture would work would develop from the, the, the notion of an analogy. And uh, we're very excited. Uh, for example, obsidian, when you break it, has something called a conchoidal fracture, a very special kind of geometry that, that, that occurs. And uh, everything is geothermally, this I learned from Matthias. Matthias said, Stephen, did I work on that? I said, no, I just adopted the last drawing you gave me from the other competition. We didn't have time to even meet. Um, and he came up with this really wonderful idea of a geothermal loop, 
an energy loop with these substations that could be regulated. But again, this is 11 million square, uh, 11 million square feet. 11, I mean, it's, it's a piece of a city. And I think what's exciting is th this kind of scale is going on in China. In fact, um, and that's what the cultural center would look like from across the river in the, in the CBD. And uh, this is still being uh, decided. In fact, and I don't have it in this presentation, what's really interesting, uh, the, the linked hybrid that we did with uh, Matthias was 660 geothermal wells um, doing all the heating and cooling in Beijing. The company uh, that built the building, Modern Group, started a sub-company called Modern Green. I didn't tell Matthias about this. They have 42 people working in their sub-company. And all of the architecture, all of the building, not architecture, but all the buildings that they build are copying the systems that we used in the linked hybrid. So there's a kind of, let's say, uh, without architecture that the, the energy systems go on in a different way. But when you build an exemplary building, a piece of architecture, it brings it you know, to, to, to the attention of the public. This is the largest thing we have under construction. Three million square feet in Chengdu, 443 geothermal wells. Um, based on turning around a developer from Singapore to make a public space out of the project rather than their formula of two towers on a podium and to connect to the city, what I call micro-urbanism. So there was a kind of, let's say, uh, uh, all around the edges instead of a shopping center being completely hermetic, it was connected and giving life to the street. And then inside, buildings within buildings. And this is a really exciting moment because my good friend Lebius Woods Oh, the building itself is sliced for the sun. Two hours of sun is, is uh, required in all Chinese housing. So the adjacent housing next to the building is actually how the building gets its geometry. <clears throat> That's um, 31 stories of reinforced concrete exterior. Matthias said you always need as much thermal mass as you can get. You know, one, one of the things about working with Matthias is he, he adds a sense of humor to everything, but when you go to sleep at night, you remember all these things that he told you, so it's very easy um, uh, to, to, to begin architecture and, and think about these things. All recycled water forms this water garden based on the poet Du Fu. This is a, a poet from 1713 that was born in Chengdu. This fugitive between the earth and the sky, from the northeast storm tossed to the southwest, time has left stranded and three valleys, which became the sort of, let's say, uh, analogy and beginning point to make three valleys the heart of this project, three water gardens. And I won't bore you with all this because other people like Matthias can talk about this, but this building will be like a equivalent of Leeds Platinum, our second one in China, three million square feet. And this will open in September. But the most exciting thing for me is that Lebius Woods, who I, I adore, a, a real poet, a kind of, let's say, visionary architect, always a teacher, will have uh, his first permanent construction here. This is a the light, the light pavilion. Is, it, it's four stories high, um, and you can occupy it. It's a real space of experience. And there it is under construction. That will be ready in September. <clears throat> the horizontal skyscraper in Vanke, a, a, a city that went from 8,000 uh, inhabitants in 1980 to 12 million today, a very interesting city. And this project was for the largest developer in South China, Vanke International. So bringing all these green elements to this project, I'm sure, uh, influences further work that they do. Um, but they were already very green. I mean, in China, there's a, there's a kind of attitude that we don't have in America. The vision of the project was to raise it and, uh, and, and have uh, views to the ocean and turn the entire site into a tropical garden open to the public. So the gardens, the public gardens, all recycled water, really, really are part of making the project. It was a competition we won. That slides from a different lecture. Um, the speed of things are very interesting. Uh, we won the competition and two years later, it's completely framed up. We got the building permit in 10 days for a horizontal skyscraper. And, and it's very interesting in terms of the construction. It's a, it's a cable stay bridge technology, so that means the minimum amount of steel and also a thermal mass in the rigid concrete frame. And it was a one, wonderful uh, 
engineer from China, Xiao Shengzhi. And then just the, the work on the site, uh, I always go to my sites and if I don't have anything to do, I help them clean the sites. And there it is at night, that's all recycled water. Make, making the louvers that are all controlled by sun, hand making, uh, 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 everything in China can be made from scratch. So that's a wonderful place to work that way and, and, and bring, bringing detail and the kind of poetic dimension to the experience of every inch of moving through this project. Um, bamboo, uh, the, the head of this Wang Shi wanted his office to be all in uh, ecologically harvested bamboo, so the entire project became a kind of experiment in bamboo. But most important, turning over that horizontal place to the public. But for me, you know, I, I'm not worried about this marginalization this 2%. I think in the end, architecture, great architecture, has always been marginal. We've always been, in a way, examples. To try to put up a really great building that has poetic dimensions is a very difficult thing, and not, it can't always be done. So I think what's really important is that poetic dimension, not trying to, let's say, change the world um, uh, and become politicians. By the way, this is also from Walter Benjamin. The Greek word polis, will continue to exist at the bottom of our political existence, that is, at the bottom of the sea, for as long as we use the word politics. So this notion uh, of being a politician and then losing the poetry. This is a project I just opened a week ago, I'm very proud of, also convincing them to geothermally heat it and cool it and recycle the water, but it's based on a piece of music. It's a, ga it's a gallery in a house, so underneath the domestic life, there's a sheet of water, and underneath the domestic life uh, uh, is there, there's a sheet of water, the three pavilions push up through it, but there's the foundation of art, he has an art collection, he, he really loves music, the, the whole project is based on this musical score, <clears throat> three little pavilions, and, and okay, it's, it's made green, uh, uh, it's sustainable, but it's not going to change the world, but yes, it does in a way. A piece of poetry has an impact beyond, beyond its existence and I think stands there as a wonderful, uh, uh, let's say, uh, condition. Um, and, and there it is. It, it's, it was a building that, because I had such freedom, I could have done anything. And I did like 20 different designs. And finally, we came, we threw all the other designs out and came to this notion of a piece of music organizing this, this building on a, on a plane of a sheet of water. This is just the entrance sequence. Walking in, coming from, uh, uh, from the outside, you see the water gardens above. And there you see the person standing uh, at the moment of the entrance pavilion. So at, as soon as you come into this complex, you're inside, but you're looking at the outside. And that, that is actually the inside of the larger outside. So there's this condition of let's say, the spatial reversal of being in a building. And water, you know, unites it. So, for me, I, I like putting these juxtapositions together, this 11 million square feet, 3 million square feet, and down here to 10,000 square feet. And there's the gallery that underlies the entire project. And I'm coming from the coronal mass ejection down through these details to the detail at the entrance where the sheet of water is drained off that pond into one little fountain. And I, I just want to end with, you know, just as Walter Benjamin understood language as essentially a poetic phenomena, I think the best architecture is essentially a poetic phenomena. Benjamin had not unique but extremely rare gift of thinking poetically. For him, the size of an object was in an inverse ratio to its significance. So I would throw out this idea that maximum impact is that inversely significant. Thank you.